Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome from all of us here in the Faculty of Science and Technology at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus in Jamaica, to all of you who are viewing in Jamaica, the wider Caribbean, and the world. A very special welcome to the students in the audience, those of you who are from primary schools, secondary schools, and or university students who have an interest in science and who want to use it as a tool for solving problems like COVID-19, or who are just here to get inspired so that they can get better grades in science. I want to welcome the policymakers and the business leaders and encourage all of you to make your contributions to this discussion, as science must hold hands with policy and business before it can create wealth and impact lives. To other members of the public who are using this as an information session, we say welcome. Please feel free to share your thoughts as you are important stakeholders in the UAE and FST, the Faculty of Science and Technology, values your partnership. The COVID-19 pandemic is the worst global crisis since World War II, and it currently threatens to eliminate the social and economic advancement that many countries, including Jamaica, have enjoyed in recent times. However, like it has done throughout history, scientific knowledge is guiding humanity through these unprecedented challenges. From characterizing the virus and sequencing its entire genome, to understanding how it is transmitted and how we best protect ourselves from it, science is fulfilling its classical goal of building knowledge and understanding, and its modern mission of solving problems and making people's lives better. The U.S. tradition of excellence has earned our triple first ratings, we are in the top 1% of universities in Latin America and Caribbean. We are in the top 1% of golden age universities in the world. And we are the only Caribbean university to be ranked in the world rankings. The Faculty of Science and Technology here at UWI Mona has played a pivotal role in establishing the UWI as a world-class institution. As it stands front and center advancing the mission of science to make people's lives better. This afternoon, as part of our Science for Today forum series, we are talking fighting COVID-19, science in action. This is round one of three rounds, with the second coming to you on August 5th and the final round on August 12th, 2020. This afternoon, we open with an impressive lineup of six contributors from the UAE and its agencies. I invite you to participate by posting your comments or questions and interacting with the speakers in the live chat, which is being moderated by my colleague, Dr. Kimberly Stevenson. Now I present our first contributor, chairperson of the External Engagement Committee on which I serve, and which is responsible for organizing this series, Dr. Andre Coy. Dr. Coy lectures in the Department of Physics here in the Faculty of Science and Technology. He, he holds a BSc in Math and Electronics, an MPhil in Climate Physics from the UAE, and a PhD in Computer Sciences from the University of Sheffield. He previously worked at McGill University, University of Sheffield, and Barnsley Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. His research interests include automatic speech recognition, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and assistive technologies. His work has led to the development of a portable speech recognition and text-to-speech device to aid individuals with speech impairment. As Associate Dean in charge of external engagement in the Faculty of Science and Technology, Dr. Coy is involved in a plethora of outreach activities which promote science and its applications to society. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, I said our faculty was front and center in advancing the mission of science. Well, Dr. Coy will expand on that with a presentation entitled The Faculty of Science and Technology and its Capacity to Respond to COVID-19. 
Thank you, Dr. Singh Wilmot. Uh, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are living in extraordinary times, and it is at times like these that extraordinary people step up and show an impact on the society that they're living in. And I want to share with you today about the Faculty of Science and Technology's response to COVID-19. The University of the West Indies has a mandate to drive and to sustain the development of the Caribbean region. And so we believe that the Faculty of Science and Technology is the go-to place for science knowledge, research, and solutions. In fact, we are convinced of it, and we want to convince you here today. So what do we offer uh, as the University of the West Indies Faculty of Science and Technology? Science is our core function. As such, we have six science departments that consist of chemistry, computing, geography and geology, life sciences, mathematics, and physics. We also have five science centers, institutes, and units. These are the Biotechnology Center, the Center for Marine Sciences, the Natural Products Institute, the Earthquake Unit, and the Mona Institute for Applied Sciences. We have over 50 science majors and minors. We have 30 taught and research graduate programs. We currently have 2,807 undergraduate students registered and 354 graduate students. As well as the excellent uh, teaching and learning that we do, we also have a strong track record in science research. Caribbean science is our core product. One of the areas that we excel in is in agriculture and bioscience. Here we do crop modeling, yield projections and predictions, we study where varieties will grow and how well they will grow there. We do plant protection through the identification of plant viruses, nematodes, and harmful bacteria. Using drones, we also study disease prevention. We look at improving post-harvest processes as well as pest management. We excel in climate studies. We do research in Caribbean climate variability and dynamics. We look at historical and projected regional, national, and sub-national climate change. We have climate portals available where we provide tools for decision making. We look at climate impacts, impacts on the economy, livestock, water, health, and the marine environment. In the marine sciences, we excel at studying coastal life and the causes of potential degradation. We look at protected areas, fishable stocks, seasons, and we study all of these at our marine laboratories. We're studying the sargassum seaweed. We look at monitoring, prediction, collection, and uses, including for bioenergy, agriculture, the anti-cancer pro properties, and for bioplastics. We study coastal nurseries, looking at mangroves, the replanting techniques, and coral reef rehabilitation. In the natural products arena, we study the potential of Jamaican and Caribbean natural products to impact our societies. We look at the safety of our natural products. We investigate the interaction of natural medicines with prescription medicines. We also investigate uh, the use of natural products and their derivatives for their potential in cancer prevention and their properties. We also look at mosquito eradication studies. In the geosciences, we excel at geomapping. We've currently mapped over 70% of the geology of Jamaica, and this has highlighted also the fault systems that exist on the island. We monitor earthquakes, and we do research in the seismic hazards uh, in Jamaica. With disaster risk resilience, we are developing tools for mitigating disaster risk. One such tool is the FEWER app, which is an early warning system for the marine environment that fishers can use to determine uh, what is happening in their environment and be warned if there's a disaster or some other event that is happening uh, around them. We provide analytical solutions. We look at air and water quality management. We look at pesticide residue determination. There's a plethora of work being done in the food chemistry area, and we also study uh, mineralogy. In computing and electronics, we look at computer intrusions, forensics, and the exploitation of uh, software security. We look at complex, complex systems modeling using robotics and system automation. 
In the machine learning area, which is uh, very current, we look at using artificial intelligence in diagnostics and problem solving, as well as other areas such as speech recognition. We look at the effects of wireless device on human health. We do software engineering research, web animation, visualization, and e-learning. These are some of the things we do in the Faculty of Science and Technology. Now, how have we used all of this uh, capacity, all this expertise in responding to COVID-19? There are many things that are being done in the faculty, and I'll highlight a few of them. We've been looking at environmental monitoring. During the lockdown period in Jamaica, we looked at several aspects of the environment, and we monitored them in order to see how lockdown would have affected uh, these aspects of the environment. Several questions are asked. What were these impacts? Are these impacts sustainable? Can we maintain the good effects that occurred during lockdown? And what can we learn from the lockdown experience as we move forward in our efforts to protect the environment? There's geospatial mapping that was being done in the British Virgin Islands. Workshops were held to assist the BVI social development team the mapping assisted in visualizing regions where the most vulnerable citizens are to be found. This exercise assisted in the planning for the delivery of care packages to the most vulnerable in that society. In the biotechnology natural products arena, the Natural Products Institute contributed to a global study on the impact of COVID-19 on ethnobiology which is essentially the study of how people interact with uh, all living things. Several questions are asked. How will the pandemic affect indigenous communities and their traditional knowledge, their subsistence and the management of their natural resources? How will the global crisis affect interactions between researchers and local communities? Beyond that, NPI is also doing research on the potential for natural products in the search for therapeutics for COVID-19. In disaster risk management, we are looking at uh, redefining the COVID-19 crisis. COVID-19 is the largest public health crisis to face the world in modern history. The researchers at the UWE are asking a question, should this be considered a crisis or should it be reclassified as a health disaster? This reclassification would allow for a change to the management of the crisis which would be modified so that some of the most vulnerable would be given more attention. In artificial intelligence, there's a multidisciplinary team that is now competing for a grant to develop AI-driven approaches to the COVID-19 response and recovery efforts. The project would cover areas such as optimizing patient diagnosis, care and recovery, forecasting transmission and reducing spread, using AI to support gender inclusivity and COVID-19 response. These are some of the areas that the FST is exploring in the fight for COVID-19. But given all of the expertise that exists, given the capacity that exists within the faculty, there is certainly more to come. How can we further leverage all of this strong track record of impactful research to increase our response to the COVID-19 crisis. We can further develop our data analysis and machine learning applications through our high-performance computing cluster, a Sparks supercomputer. We could also further develop the mobile applications for contact tracing, local infection monitoring, and spread prevent prediction. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that I have convinced you about the capacity of the Faculty of Science and Technology, not only to deliver science to our students, not only to do research which is beneficial to our, our faculty, but also to do research which is impactful to the society, to develop applications that are going to help us during this crisis and as we move forward. And so I will end where I began. The Faculty of Science and Technology is the go-to place for science knowledge research and solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Coy. I stand proud after that talk as a member of this team of researchers in the Faculty of Science and Technology. You have shown us that science and scientists create, 
science solves problems, and that certainly right here in Jamaica, we have the capacity to do it right here on the Mona campus. The FST is certainly the go-to place for science, knowledge, research, and solutions. Now, testing is such a critical component in the COVID-19 fight, but there is so much that the public does not know about the screening process. Our second contributor, Dr. Sandra Jackson, will be demystifying COVID-19 screening for all of us, and she is well suited to do this. Sandra Jackson is a medical microbiologist, a clinical virologist, and a public health consultant. She has earned the degrees of MBBS, DM, and MPH from the University of the West Indies and has worked with UWE for over 20 years. With an interest in influenza, Dr. Jackson acted as director at the National Influenza Center for Jamaica for 15 years, following which she joined the World Health Organization Global Influenza Program in Geneva from 2015 to 2019 as a consultant virologist. Her research interests include viral respiratory infections, pandemic preparedness and response, emerging viral infections, and the standardization of WHO global respiratory virus surveillance. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Sandra Jackson. Good evening. Thank you for that introduction. And I would like to thank the Faculty of Science and Technology for inviting me to speak on demystifying COVID-19 screening. As we move forward and progress through the pandemic, we need to understand how we proceed and what the next steps are with regards to surveillance and the role of screening as this will play in the mitigating the spread of the pandemic and controlling it. Many studies have shown that approximately 80% of persons have mild uh, infection or are asymptomatic with about 20% progressing to moderate to severe disease. In those that progress to moderate to severe disease, there is a very wide spectrum of uh, pathogenesis and, um, and that, that occurs associated with the disease, including a cytokine storm, they have associated a coagulopathies with it, and also immune right now hyperinflammatory responses, uh, particularly in children. Prior to the onset of symptoms, uh, there is a pre-symptomatic uh, phase in which the patient will present with symptoms that are very similar to that of flu and any other acute upper respiratory tract illness. So it's difficult to differentiate uh, the patient's who are presenting as uh, such as with the common cold or with flu in the pre-symptomatic phase. Surveillance so far has targeted patients that are presenting to clinics or to sentinel sites presenting with acute upper respiratory tract or lower respiratory tract infections and also severe cases that have been admitted to hospitals looking to identify the SARS-CoV-2 virus in these cases. Much contact tracing has taken place, contact tracing of confirmed cases, and some of these contact cases are defined as close contacts, and some are not, so not, not as close, but they are followed up to see if they are going to contract the disease and present as well. And then there's targeted uh, surveillance and screening that has also occurred in which uh, we look for the high-risk groups that are most vulnerable to um, having severe outcomes and poor outcomes of the disease. Not everyone with COVID-19 feels sick, as I said. And a new report of 238 young adults, uh, service members on a naval aircraft, tested positive for um, COV-2 virus. So this clearly shows that there's a large percent of persons who are asymptomatic who are potential carriers and drivers of this um, pandemic. 
how is the virus spreading? If we look at other examples, such as the choir practice that occurred in the United States last month, um, in which there was one symptomatic person, and that one person infected 87% of the group of other persons who were um, attending the choir practice. When we look in the healthcare system, 90,000 healthcare workers have been infected so far with more than 260 nurses dying from SARS-CoV-2. And this data is not taken globally. It only represents 30 countries. And this was published in June 2020 by the International Council of Nurses. Not only are healthcare workers getting ill, but healthcare workers within the setting also have the potential to pass on to transmit the virus to other inpatients, hospital inpatients or outpatient or the healthcare center. There are countries that have experienced high burdens of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and who have dealt with it successfully. For example, COVID-19 in South Korea. South Korea's response to testing, increased testing throughout, uh, um, knowing that the virus was highly contagious and that there were asymptomatic patients who were able to transmit the disease, uh, resulted in a very positive outcome. In South Korea alone, they performed 1.5 million tests. Um, with a, and their result positivity of 0.9% is, is, is very good. When we compare reported cases and deaths by country, territory, uh, and then look at Jamaica and at South Korea, although South Korea has a population of 51 million and Jamaica that of 2.9 million, when we look at the number of tests per million population that has been done, South Korea has performed 29,000 deaths per million and Jamaica 11,000, uh, approximately 12,000 uh, tests per million in population. When we look at the total number of cases per million persons uh, in South Korea, they, they have reported 276 cases per million and Jamaica 283 cases per million. Looking at South Korea, as they have opened up their borders, we see that although to curb, initially to curb the transmission of the virus, healthcare professionals, committees, governments had a combined approach, which included extensive COVID screening, effective patient triaging, uh, transparent provision of information, and e extensive use of technology. And looking at the graph here, at the daily cases that have been reported um, recently, uh, we see in pink, what we have are the imported cases, and in blue, these are the cases that are the locally acquired cases or community acquired cases. So as they opened up their borders, you saw an increase in the number of imported cases. But uh, strategies were put back in place to monitor this. So when we speak and we refer, we refer to surveillance versus screening, what we need to, uh, to, to, to look at is surveillance of patients presenting to sentinel sites or to healthcare facilities uh, who are symptomatic. And um, there are certain screening that will accompany these patients uh, to assess the severity of their presentation and also we're looking at um, screening, not just clinically, but also from, in, from the laboratory aspect to confirm whether or not the case is a COVID case or one of the other respiratory infections, such as influenza. In accordance with the Jamaica National Surveillance Protocol for the surveillance of COVID-19, surveillance proceeds in a specific manner with targeted surveillance of special groups. And this includes the respiratory tract infections, as I explained previous, on the previous slide. And these will include your ILI, SARI, or your lower respiratory tract infections. And your entry surveillance is in place currently. And this is for returning residents 
tourists and business travelers. All symptomatic persons are screened and sampled at the ports of entry. Returning residents and general tourists must submit evidence of negative COVID tests as a, a test result from a recognized laboratory before or as part of the entry process into the island. And all business travelers are screened upon arrival. When we look at the symptomatic phases, we should remember that 80% of these cases are going to recover, whereas 20% will develop or may develop mild to moderate illnesses. With these 20% that develop mild to moderate illnesses and the 80% that do recover, they are infectious. And looking at the curves, if we look at the line that's shown here that says virus, for those who recover without complications, the virus usually um, is eliminated by day 14. However, in those who have more severe course of infections, the virus can continue for up to day 21 and for longer periods. If PCR is done, peace polymerase chain reaction, which is a test uh, that can detect the viral RNA, what they've found is that even there are some patients who, are, um, who have recovered and who are not severe, but they're still detecting uh, virus RNA. When they try to culture this, it's not culturable um, after, say, 14 days. So for, on this, when we look at the slide surveillance of symptomatic cases, for those cases or persons who have been symptomatic, it's necessary to trace their and um, investigate their close contacts and their contacts. And in doing so, then they're further able to classify them as probable cases or suspect cases and with the laboratory confirmation, finally, as confirmed cases. So how do we define a contact? A contact is a person who experienced any one of the following exposures. Direct physical contact, which means face-to-face -face, or direct care of a patient who is confirmed to have COVID, or two days before or 14 days after the onset of symptoms of a probable or confirmed case. How do we define a close contact? A close contact is someone who has been within one meter of a confirmed case during their symptomatic period, including four days before the onset of symptoms. I show you this slide, the clinical similarities and um, differences between flu and COVID-19 because COVID or SARS-CoV-2 is the virus causes the disease COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 has some presentations that are not typically seen with influenza. And also we have to remember as summer approaches, we have allergies and also the common cold uh, viruses, uh, such as the rhinoviruses and other viruses that um, can also cause respiratory infection. So not everything is COVID. So when we look at those patients who are in the pre-symptomatic phase or prodromal phase, uh, the virus is still present and they're still able to shed the virus and transmit the virus. There's another portion of patients who are asymptomatic throughout the time that they are shedding the virus and they do not present with any symptoms. So both the pre-symptomatic and the asymptomatic cases ha have potential to um, transmit the virus to others. As we said, uh, this slide is from CDC, one out of five persons reported no symptoms with um, COVID. The contribution of pre-symptomatic transmission to the COVID-19 outbreak has a relatively high impact. And if we look at this graph here, the pre-symptomatic um, cases is depicted in the pink with um, those with um, after symptoms onset in the green. 
So the potentially high contribution of the pre-symptomatic transmission would be a large dent in the hope for controlling the outbreak. And it implies that um, limiting pre-symptomatic transmission, for example, via public health messages and encouraging self-isolation, even when mild symptoms um, will need to play an integral part in controlling the pandemic. So the infectious period can be defined as a period uh, thought to be one to three days before the onset of symptoms with an additional seven to 12 days after the symptoms arise. Shedding in patients with severe disease requiring hospitalization has been demonstrated to um, transmit or to shed the virus for up to 20 days post the onset of symptoms. So is screening necessary for in asymptomatic and how would you do this uh, among your contacts or your close contacts and in your pre-symptomatic phase? This is a challenging question that, um, that is looked at in, in, and one of the purposes of screening. Also, we have to look at the tar population of targeted or high-risk um, individuals uh, that will have a poor outcome in order to detect the virus early. Several studies have been done on the asymptomatic um, cases and reported different um, percentages uh, varying from 43%. Uh, 42%, 87.9%, uh, 62%, one, a study in Ohio and Virginia among the inmates reported asymptomatic cases among 96%, uh, hospital employees 65%, um, passengers on the cruise ship 81%. Uh, so we see the relevance of pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic cases in the control of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is going to be significant. So in targeted surveillance, what we're looking at are your high-risk groups, such as your elderly or your patients with hypertension, um, to, as diabetics, as these cases have been shown to have uh, poorer outcomes. In screening and looking at the properties of a screening test, this is done usually on apparently healthy individuals and it's applied to groups, can be applied to groups as well. Uh, they're based on criteria in which there is a cutoff for that particular population. Sometimes in terms of the screening test may be less accurate, they may be less expensive than diagnostic tests. And screening tests are not usually um, sometimes the basis for treatment, although there must be some kind of management protocol in place when screening is going to um, be introduced. When we look at diagnostic tests, diagnostic tests are done on sick or ill individuals and they can or they can be applied to a single patient. The diagnosis is not final and it's based on evaluation of both the result and also the signs and symptoms in addition to the lab findings. The diagnostic tests are more accurate. Sometimes they tend to be more expensive, such as the PCR is more expensive than uh, immunochromatographic um, rapid tests. And it's used as a basis for treatment. And also the initiative usually comes from the patient who seeks um, medical attention. In looking at the operational considerations for the identification of healthcare workers and inpatients uh, with suspected COVID-19 in the non-US healthcare settings, if we look at passive strategies uh, that were used, uh, healthcare workers were asked to self-assess themselves for fever and a defined set of um, symptoms indicative of COVID-19. And then if fever or respiratory symptoms were present, then the healthcare workers were asked would, would report remotely this information. 
They do not report directly to the healthcare facility, but they were provided with immediate medical assessment and follow-up actions via telemedicine as to whether they should come in for one-on-one -on -one treatment or assessment. Using this passive strategy enables the mechanisms for identification of healthcare workers at an increased likelihood of infection, whereas it also saves on the resource requirements that are needed. If we apply this similar strategy to an operational consideration for passive and enhanced or active COVID-19 screening of students returning to university, national and preliminary screening protocols and tools should also be available for students, both at the primary, secondary and tertiary levels. For international students, uh, the same uh, travel authorization and screening protocols applying to tourists should also apply to students and also their protocols should be in place for national students. Assessments by students can be done as with healthcare workers in the previous study by online screening using online screening tools and a protocol for follow-up of suspect or probable unconfirmed cases uh, should be in place for the management. So the strategies for screening would include passive strategies, enhanced passive and also active strategies. So we discussed the passive strategies. So looking at enhanced passive strategies, this would include reporting alerts are, that are initiated by the data source with an added mechanism to prompt data collection, review and, and or of the reporting. For active strategies, we're looking at reporting alerts are initiated by the centralized health authority, such as the Ministry of Health, uh, the facility infection preventionist, and also the facility administrator using a known set of rules and regulations. So all three can be employed at various um, degrees. When screening, can be mass screening, which uh, would apply to large unselected populations where everyone in a group is screened regardless of the probability of having the disease or the condition. This tends to be expensive, an expensive um, method, and it's not done, um, it's not affordable um, in many countries. And then there is a high risk or selective targeted screening such as we would target asthmatics or hypertensive patients for screening. Multipurpose screening refers to screening by more than one test done simultaneously on a particular case. For example, a respiratory sample is collected. It can be tested for both COVID-19 and also for influenza. We must remember that influenza still is an emerging virus and that um, with pandemic potential, and it is important to detect such viruses at an early stage. And multiphasic screening refers to various diagnostic procedures used to um, during the same screening. For instance, with diabetes, they could use the fasting glucose and the glucose tolerance test. Looking at the tests that are done, the laboratory tests, there are certain characteristics that we should strive to have uh, within the laboratory test or assay that is used for the screening. Presently, uh, WHO has a list, World Health Organization has a list of recommended um, tests to be used with COVID for confirmatory diagnosis. And um, the CDC and also the Euro CDC, most of the regional um, headquarters and offices, reference labs, do have um, protocols that are available. The validity or the accuracy of the test is important in terms of uh, knowing how many true positives there are, and this is termed the sensitivity or how many 
two negatives there are because you want a test that's going to detect when the positives, when the case is a true positive and also have a good predictive accuracy. So we speak and we refer to the positive predictive value, which is the probability that the result of that test is going to, that has a positive, is truly positive for the disease. And the negative predictive value of the test uh, is the probability that subjects with a negative screening test uh, are truly, do not have the disease. The cutoff point of the test or assay that is used is also very important because the cutoff point uh, in terms of COVID, using COVID as an example, and um, the PCR uh, to detect the viral particles in the swab, uh, if the cutoff point is too low, then you're going to get more positives than you should have. So your sensitivity would be high. If your cutoff is too low, then your specificity in terms of the number of negatives that you have will be, will be lower. So you have a greater chance of having false positives originate when you have a cutoff that is too low. Similarly, having a cutoff that is too high will result in the opposite. It will result in a lower number of positives and a higher number of um, negatives, false negatives being produced. Now, which test you're going to use for your screening will depend on uh, the type of disease, how lethal is it? Uh, for instance, uh, in, in terms of you, you have a pandemic virus and you want to um, interrupt the transmission of it. So therefore you need to determine, is it more important for you to have true positives or true negatives. With true positives, you are able to interrupt the chain of transmission. The Institute of Microbiology from Lucene in Switzerland um, published this article uh, on the diagnostic strategies for SARS-CoV-2 infection and interpretation of microbiology results. Uh, looking at it, it actually showed the piece, ability of the PCR to detect the virus, live virus up to day 14, 15. By when I say live virus, this is virus that is able to be cultured after. Um, in terms of the diagnostic serology, we see that the I, antibody to IgG and the IgM start to arise on day five. Antibody to the nuclear protein start to arise from um, before day five, actually, it arises early, that's the IgG, but then it falls off. And then we have antibody to the S protein or the spike protein that um, develops from day five onward, and it will remain elevated for some period of time. So why this graph is, is interesting because it actually shows the different components, the antibody being developed to the to the spike protein, the IgG, and the antibody um, developed to the N protein. So we're looking at the slide on antigen detection, we'll ask ourselves, so in terms of the polymerase chain reaction, just a reminder that the genes that, are, that, that the primers and probes are targeting include the E gene, the N gene, and the RD RNP genes. So uh, these three are um, diagnostic for COVID-19. Uh, looking at the next slide in terms of the PCR positivity uh, duration of this, as I had mentioned before, in terms of days um, after symptom, you PCR can continue. You will find, however, that the CT value may be higher than um, expected, but if you try to culture, you will end. You will get a culture negative um, sample. And, and this next slide uh, speaks to that duration of infectivity of the particular um, positive sample. And we see that on the top row here, uh, the culture is positive up until day eight. 
um, and then it's negative up until day 14, you will see after the onset of symptoms. So you will continue to get negative um, up until day 14, they should be, able, should be clear. Duration of infectivity and seroconversion, you will see as was shown in the previous slide, that the percent of seroconversion of the patients, it's approximately from day five, looking at this graph here, from day five, the um, antibodies start to be produced, the patient starts to seroconvert. Also, in terms of all the, though we said that the nasopharyngeal swab is the recommended swab for the PCR, uh, there are studies that have looked at using the saliva as a viable alternative. And they actually found the saliva to be a little bit more sensitive than the nasopharyngeal swab in this um, study. Upper versus lower respiratory tract infections. Uh, the saliva and endotracheal aspirate, of course an endotracheal aspirate would give you, uh, in more moderate to severe cases, would give you a better positivity. Uh, but um, we can see here from this slide, upper versus lower respiratory tract, that the virus um, is detectable in the saliva as well. What about patient collected testing? We have heard where um, there are patients, there, there, there are states, and um, both in Europe, Asia, and in the US uh, that are promoting for the patients to collect their own samples and they would send them in to get tested. So this FDA has approved the first standalone at-home sample collection kit and this can be used um, with certain authorized tests that the FDA has on its list. So there are various methods to try and improve the amount of testing that is done. And also um, next generation sequencing will also have a part to play in um, going forward in both diagnostic testing and in surveillance. Uh, particularly there's, there are certain reference centers that are just going straight to sequencing now uh, because um, it would be able to tell you immediately, is it COVID-19 or is it another novel pathogen that you are, that's being detected? What they do know is that persons who have more severe infections will develop a more robust antibody response. So in accordance with the National Surveillance Protocol, for um, COVID-19 in Jamaica. The surveillance system that is in place, we go to the next slide. Uh, we're showing you some of the representatives here from the Ministry of Health uh, who collaborate with the Department of Microbiology, Virology and National Influenza Center in enabling the surveillance and um, screening, which is to come of um, SARS-CoV-2. On the next slide, I'm showing you, this is the laboratory staff that has been working behind the scenes. Uh, there you ha have the NIC director, Professor Monica Smichael and her team. And these are the faces of the persons behind the mask who are working seven days a week to get um, the testing done. Uh, information, detailed information with regards to uh, the targeted surveillance that is in place for the novel coronavirus uh, is documented in the Ministry of Health and Wellness um, Coronavirus Disease Epidemiological Surveillance Protocol. When we refer to some of the new developments in um, technology with, for screening, uh, looking back at um, to these two doctors, um, Pagarty um, and, um, and her professor looked at actually the tongue 
as a prob probable site to sample for COVID-19. And this is because the tongue has an abundant amount of ACE2 receptors on it. So therefore, they found that swapping the tongue or scraping the tongue can give just as an effective uh, result as doing um, the a nasopharyngeal swab and it's less dramatic. And a new method, the method that is also being used is actually to detect proteins, two proteins that are individually present um, in COVID-19 in SARS-CoV-2 that were not present in SARS or MERS. And these two proteins include um, CL-PRO and PL-PRO. These two proteins are what they look for. And it's a very simple, rapid test in which a chemical reaction with a color change within one minute. If both proteins are present, then there will be a color change. When we look at the genetic characterization of the novel coronavirus, and we look at the GISAID, at the genetic um, data that's there as of the 26th of May, we will see some information there from Jamaica. Uh, we've submitted um, analysis of the sequences of the COVID-19 viruses identified. Them, and we see that within Jamaica, there are, although there are six clades, different clades of COVID-19 virus that have been um, described at this point, uh, with, with Jamaica, uh, the clade that the viruses have been I belong to include V clade and also the GH clade. So that's the V clade and the GH clade are the two clades to which. And if we look on the slide here, okay, the V is depicted in the red and the GH in the green. Right? And um, we look at... Uh, what is the genetic characterization of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in, um, in the UK? Because we get quite a few visitors from the UK when we are we were opening up our borders. And we will see that within the UK, they have a mixture of clades present there. Not just the V, not just the VH, V and not the GH and the V, but they also have in the UK all of the other clades present. What about in the United States? Similar in the United States, they have the GH, but they have more of the other G clades also present, GR and G, and also they have um, S and L, including a very little amount of the V clade, which we have here. I didn't include the slide here in Brazil. Brazil, it's more the, the G uh, clade, although it's a mixture, but it's a G clade that they are seeing more in Brazil. So in summary, continued clinical and laboratory screening is necessary to minimize the morbidity and mortality of COVID-19. Both passive and active screening should be employed. Screening should be combined with continued mitigation policies for optimal control and continued education of the public about transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is necessary. Healthcare workers require a sound understanding of the time frame to sample cases and interpretation of results according to the phase of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Although the nasopharyngeal swab is a recommended sample, research in the use of saliva and the tongue samples should also be considered. Cooled sampling is most effective in low prevalence COVID-19 populations. And presently, SARS-CoV-2 claims in Jamaica are V and GH. It is expected that other SARS-CoV-2 clades will be introduced into Jamaica as the borders open. Continued surveillance and testing will therefore be necessary to enable early detection and control of transmission. 
with that. Thank you for listening. And I'd like to express appreciation to Professor Monica Smichael, the NIC team, the principal of the University of the West Indies, the dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences, the dean of Faculty of Science and Technology, and the principal of UE Mona and the Ministry of Health for their support to the National Influenza Center during these challenging times of the COVID-19 pandemic. Stay safe and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jackson. We have certainly emerged from your presentation with a greater appreciation for the screening process. And now that all has been demystified about that, we can advance to tracking and predicting the spread of COVID-19. This will be the focus of the next talk, which will be given by Dr. Paris Lua Ayi Jr., Managing Director of Mona Geoinformatics Institute. Dr. Lua Ayi, a former head of the Department of Geography and Geology here in the Faculty of Science and Technology, is responsible for overseeing all commercial research and development activities at Mona Geoinformatics Institute, MGI, and led the development of the region's first GPS navigation system, JAMNAV. In his active research, Dr. Liu Ai works on natural hazard analysis, crime and security systems modeling, road safety analysis, health systems mapping, transport systems and modeling. Ladies and gentlemen, it goes on and on. Data analytics, GPS systems, and so many others that are relevant to Jamaica, the Caribbean, and the world. The methodical and data-driven approach that the government of Jamaica has employed to successfully manage the local spread of COVID-19 has been supported by Dr. Lua Ai and his team at MGI. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Paris Lua Ai is the person to speak on the topic tracking and predicting COVID-19. Please give him a warm welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share our experiences and adventures in dealing with uh, COVID experiences for the last couple of months. Um, we've had a very exciting few months that we'd like to share with you in terms of what we've been doing at the Mona Geoinformatics Institute in tracking and predicting uh, the, the, the ravages of COVID-19 in, in Jamaica in particular, but generally around the world in terms of, of, of contextualizing what's happening out there. What we have been doing is looking at the, the cases of COVID in Jamaica, but we want to put ourselves in perspective here. Where are we in, uh, compared to the rest of the region? Are we doing very well? Are we doing badly? The answer is kind of in between. We're doing better than some, like Dominican Republic and so on, um, but we're also uh, not as good as other countries. Cuba is doing particularly well per capita and other countries in the Caribbean. So we need to benchmark and baseline ourselves in terms of cases over the region. We've been seeing where we in Jamaica had the April spike in cases and we saw something like that happen in Haiti. We see something like that happening in Antigua uh, and different countries. We need to establish how do we compare in terms of how do we proceed in terms of analysis, in terms of tracking and predicting cases going forward. So to do this, we look at the, the overall ecosystem. We look at the the, the, the number of direct flights to Jamaica on the, the left of your screen. You will see where the, we have regularly scheduled flights as well as seasonal flights from Europe, from North America, from South America, from Panama. All these places are coming in to the Caribbean directly. And this was early on into the cases of COVID um, around the world. So before we started to lock down, we started to mobilize to see what's going on in terms of the rest of the world. We had cases in, 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 in Bull Bay, but a definition of Bull Bay is a little bit too general for the quarantine area. So we went and defined the different sections of Bull Bay. We're talking about 8 mile, 9 mile, 11 mile, West Haven, St. Benedict's, all these different components of what we are colloquially calling Bull Bay. We need to define the area, square off the area of quarantine and begin to define what's going on. Then we had this lockdown in St. Catherine. And we want to figure out how do we look at logistics of enforcing a lockdown. So we went and isolated all the inter-parish road crossings between uh, St. Catherine and St. Anne, St. Catherine and, 
and St. Andrews, St. Catherine and Clarendon and so on. And identify those points where people are likely to move across the border and then figure out what they're going to be doing after that. We also then looked at the CCTV camera footage across the country to look at pictures of the lockdown, pictures of the curfew at night. It was quite something to see, where you're able to see all these deserted roads at, at 8 p.m. Uh, and halfway tree and crossroads and Old Hope Road and so on, all these, these completely empty roads uh, and so on. So it was very important that we began to see what's happening out there in the field in real time. But by none, the most exciting and most rewarding project we've ever been in my career has been working with the private sector organization of Jamaica's COVID response fund. Um, they've raised uh, over $182 million, um, benefited uh, over 50,000 people in terms of giving them care packages and so on. It was a remarkable collaboration, especially with different members of the private sector, donors and so on, but also in particular, the Jamaica Defense Force and the Jamaica Constabulary Force that provided extraordinary logistics and, 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 and other capabilities. But this showed to me the important value of teamwork and cooperation. We were able to hand off to the JDF for them to execute their logistics uh, and hand off to the donors to be able to gather supplies and distribute them in, in real time. So what this did, what, what, what we did here was to identify the 25 most vulnerable communities in Jamaica. Now this is going to be very important because these are the people who are going to be most affected by the COVID lockdown, whether or not they themselves have COVID. And it was something that we really had to, to pull out all the stops to get this thing right. Um, but what it also allowed us was the, the identification of key groups of people right now in concert with so many different variables here. It's not enough to say we want to find the old people and that's it. We wanted to find where are the diabetics, where are the hypertensive, the disabled people, the poor people, the uneducated people, people who are subject to the ravages of crime. All of these things were put together. And in order to do that, we had to individually isolate each of these groups of people. So what you're seeing on the screen right now are the individual addresses for diabetics, for hypertensives, for disabled people in Jamaica. These are the registered people. But we're talking several hundred thousand each. Um, identified by address, and therefore we're able now to lock in how we're going to address and handle these people. So all of this led to the development of the model which incorporated 22 different variables. We're not talking about just the old people or just the diabetics. We're talking communities that have old people and diabetics and hypertensives and disabled and poor and uneducated. All of those things combined. So you do have several poor communities that don't make the list because they don't have a high number of diabetics or they don't have a high number of disabled people and so on. You have to have that combination for this to work. We use several hundred thousand um, individual reference points that resulted in over 20,000 combinations of variables. And we are able then to test several dozen scenarios. What would happen if the whole country locks down? What would happen if uh, Kingston and St. Andrew is next after St. Catherine. What would happen with the individual cases of Anato Bay when Anato Bay went under quarantine? All of these things were, were being tested in real time using the model. The model is fed by the data, the mapping, the mapping information, but ultimately the model is uh, a dynamic uh, system that allows us to begin to test scenarios in real time, whether or not you are a mapping person or not. But fundamentally, the model allows us to be data-driven in our approach and justification for the selection of communities for assistance. It frees us from the uh, influences of politics or from people's individual personal networks or friendships. It allows accountability to the donors for them to be able to account for the spend and their involvement in a project like this, free from any kind of political um, associations and so on. And that was one of the most beneficial things for the project in terms of being able to, to be transparent and, and, and allow uh, accountability to the many donors who are part of this project. So the top 25 communities included, and Old Harbor and Linstead topped the list. And this was before um, the April um, uh, surge in cases. Uh, and those communities ended up being the top 
uh, communities case-wise. This is before we even knew all of that. Um, but then we began to use variables like crime, unemployment, all of those things to begin to, to, to whittle down this figure here and identify these are the communities we need to go in. JDF goes in to those communities, does their logistics, deploy them using the, the, um, the Jamaica Constabulary Forces and the different donor agencies. And we're out there helping 50, 50 over 1,000 people. Uh, and that was really rewarding. So this is the the mapped output of those vulnerable communities. The areas in red, the communities in red, are those that we identified as areas that we need to focus on in terms of, of, of COVID relief, whether or not you had cases. So even though St. Catherine was the real overall hot spot, we knew that it was gonna be a hot spot whether or not they actually had cases, simply because these places have the most number of people who are old, who are hypertensive, diabetic, poor, disabled, unemployed, and so on. And we're able now to, 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 to pre-mobilize into these areas. Now, when we look at this thing in July, we identified 16 of the 25 communities are now trending downwards. And that's a really good thing for us to hear. Um, four months into the, into the pandemic and two months into the, the, the um, relief distribution, um, three, three communities um, are still trending upwards. So we're, we're watching those things, whether or not we need to refocus into these areas. But by and large, again, as I said earlier, we're looking at accountability and transparency. We're here trying to show that the 25 communities that were selected are being monitored right now for performance, for results, which is what we really were after here in the, in the, in the PSOJ um, program. Now, knowing vulnerable communities is one thing, but individual assets are going to be critical as well. You can be in a very low vulnerability community, but a nursing home is particularly vulnerable, whether or not you're in a, in a good community or not. Children's homes are extremely sensitive to these things. And, and as we saw in April, the BPO locations are also areas that we need to watch. So we have, we, have, we have eyes on these places. We're not showing COVID cases right now. We're just showing the location of individually vulnerable infrastructural assets right now. And to be able to say, okay, we've got to focus on these areas. Uh, if you have a nursing home in Linstead, that's exponentially worse than a nursing home in, in, in the middle of, of Savannah Lamar or so, or so on. Then we look at sector impacts right now. We can say, yes, schools are going to be affected, hotels are going to be affected, beaches are going to be affected. Let's see, let's see where these are across Jamaica. So we can then show you uh, entertainment locations that will be closed down or groceries and wholesale stores that are going to have to ramp up because people are going to be stuck at home more cooking. They're going to need food. Uh, let's see where those are. Let's see where the, 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 the emergency services are uh, in totality. We're not looking at one or the other. We're looking at all of them combined. And then when we combine them all by community on the top right, you can then begin to see which communities are going to be most affected. You know which businesses are going to be affected. Now let's see which communities are going to be most affected. We're moving at individual property scale, going out to community scale, going to parish scale, and going back where we, we, it's very dynamic. And it's something that we're very excited to, to explore those kinds of possibilities for the kinds of response, responses that we, we want to, 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 to envisage and in, in incorporate as a country. Uh, and in, in the bottom right, you can see a lot of reds. Those are, the area, those are the individual assets in Jamaica that would be negatively affected one way or another by the, by the COVID. COVID situation. So a lot of schools are going to be closed down. A lot of uh, churches are going to be affected. All of those things are accounted for in the individual um, asset mapping. Nothing here so far is showing actual COVID cases right now. It's all showing the infrastructural or social economic impacts of the pandemic. But then we can now look at the cases themselves. So this is, this is neither here nor there. It's when we put it together. Um, overall, as of July 11, though, these are the communities that have, ha that have had COVID cases. Um, again, Old Harbor and Linstead um, top that top the list, and we do see Greater Portmore, we do see Waterford, we do see other areas in red, but we do see that COVID has touched every single parish in Jamaica, and um, and we now need to see what's going on. When you zoom in now on the Kingston, St. Andrew, and St. Catherine regions, you can see that this thing was was all over the place. 
but not everywhere. Um, and it's very important to, to see that kind of, of, of distribution of cases. This is distribution by community. Uh, so previously I was showing it individual assets, individual churches or nursing homes in Linstead, in Old Harbor and so on. Those situate themselves on top of this kind of information and then now you're able to see what's going on in the middle of the storm. So when you look at the individual cases in March, you see the cases in, in, in Rocky Point and, and, and Hayes and in um, Bull Bay and so on. But as we go into April, we see the boom in, 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 um, in St. Catherine. We saw what happened um, with the, the, the BPO outfit in Portmore, resulting in Portmore community, Spanish Town, Old Harbor, and, 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 and Linstead in particular, really exploding in terms of, of, of cases on the map. And then we started to cool, those areas started to cool off except for Old Harbor. But then we started to see cases popping up in the North Coast now. So um, Runaway Bay, Discover Bay, St. Anne's Bay, those areas started to pop up. And then we moved into June and we start seeing a little bit more migration to the north and to the, to the west. And into July we're starting to see Westmoreland and Hanover communities starting to pop up into the picture. While St. Catherine has pretty much cooled down. But looking at the difference between cases between April and March, you can see that explosion in, in St. Catherine. But you can also see between May and April how much St. Catherine cooled down. Um, but other areas started to, to go orange and red now. Going into, into, the, into the next series of months and, and progressing, we can see that this, the case counts by community is really migrating across the country. It is very important not to just look at national information, national scale information, when we're trying to look at local scale planning and local scale activities. Um, and so July to June, you can see areas are cooling off, but areas are warming up, and then you can see the cases popping up in, in the west, which were up until then fairly cool. We also want to look at the trends of cases. So we see through the month of March, individual communities trending up in red or trending down in green. Some cases um, popped up early in March and nothing happened after then, so they trended downward in, in March, which is a good thing. But then in, in um, April, you see everything is trending up in, um, in St. Catherine. And we want to see what's going on in those areas. What happened in St. Mary in, in April as well? Everybody's thinking about, about um, St. Catherine. It's not just St. Catherine. In May, you could see, again, start, things started to trend down in St. Catherine, but in other places in Jamaica, in other communities, in other parishes, they started to trend up. Uh, and we saw this, the same kind of, 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 of pattern in the north and the west in June and into uh, July. Um, where the pattern kind of shifted. You do have smaller outbreaks here and there. But overall, for the four months between March and July, uh, you can see that the north and the west are the ones that are trending upwards um, between March and now, whereas St. Catherine has pretty much cooled off for the most part, except for um, communities here and there in, 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 in Hellshire, Portmore, and so on. Now, Trending can be trending up steeply or trending up gen uh, gently, but it's still trending upwards. Uh, and, and it's important to show that distribution and planning across, um, across the country. Now, what we also did were rolling seven-day cumulative totals. We could also do rolling seven-day averages or whatever, but this essentially is a map that you're looking at right now. Every single community in Jamaica is represented here. You can see the, 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 the red areas, uh, red and blue and green. Those are the St. Catherine communities that spiked in April and sort of plateaued off since then. You do see communities showing a step-like increase, um, which is showing um, sporadic outbreaks here and there over the time series. But of concern in terms of prediction would be to see what is going on closer to July and June. Which areas are trending upwards in July and June? And you can see a few communities are popping up um, in, in, in the latter half of the latter parts of the time series, whereas for the most part, those spikes in, in St. Catherine have kind of flattened out. Every single community in Jamaica is represented on this one graph, which is why it looks so busy, but you can then begin to isolate which ones you want to, to focus on, which one is of particular interest to you as the parish municipal councillor, or as a, as a minister, or as a church organization, or a Chamber of Commerce. You want to be able to see this type of information quite easily. 
What we have done now in terms of prediction is quite exciting in terms of looking at the movement of people. It is one thing to know where people live. You want to know where people go and how to track it. What you're looking at right now are 35,000 what we call origin destination pairs where people live and where they go in this particular case to access pharmaceutical services. So we have 30, 35,000 pairs right here. And the red lines are the, the, the movement of people towards or from crossroads. Blue is halfway tree. Green is um, Spanish town. So you can see the movement of people and how far they go. On the inset map, you can see red is Montego Bay, blue is um, Mandeville, and you can see how far people go to access services in Mandeville. How far do people go to access services in Montego Bay and so on. And you can sort of begin to draw a line to show the area of influence of these, of these people. And these are the mixing zones. Where you see Spanish town people mixing up with crossroad people, mixing up with halfway tree people, that's how things could potentially spread. That is how you want to see um, if a case, what is the probability of a case in Spanish town reaching um, Manchinil? Or, or, or Moran Point. Uh, we want to be able to see what is the likelihood of these type of things here. This is by no means uh, comprehensive, but at 35,000 um, pairs right now, we have a, a fairly large sample in, and an idea of where, of where people are going and what they're doing. You do have people who go from Kingston to Montego Bay, but not on a daily basis uh, to access services. So we're trying to get a grasp of what's going on with, with individual people. The vulnerable people, the vulnerable facilities, how people move, and of course the COVID cases that are sitting down on top of the entire country. So finally, we really have to look at the nature of scale. S scale is, going, is so critical because when you look at national information, it means nothing if you're trying to get a grasp of something in your parish. Then you want to look at, uh, and we saw an entire lockdown of an entire parish, which is the largest pa parish population-wise. But that means nothing if you're trying to quarantine an Otto Bay, Enfield, or Dover in St. Mary. So you want to be able to drill down more and more and more, and the information needs to get more granular each time. We have to understand the nature of the space-time dynamics to look at the, 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 and account for the role of the, mobil the mobility of populations, but also how people mix in terms of where they go, what they do, um, and, and so on, and the type of activities and services that they access. But the final point I want to make here is the importance of contextual data. People are obsessed with primary data. You need to know the case number, you need to know the case number. I mean, if you have an alien invasion right now, I mean, what's the history for that? You need to prepare anyway. So what we have to be able to do is to try to account for where you, which assets are vulnerable, which people are vulnerable, prepare for that. And then when eventualities happen, then you know what to do instead of trying, that's, or instead of when something happens, that's when you begin to prepare. So that's, our, that's our, in, in a nutshell, our adventures in COVID for the past four months. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you so much, Dr. Lua Ai, for your contribution and for the tremendous work that you and your team at MGI are doing, tracking and predicting COVID-19. I am sure, like me, the audience is impressed, especially with the scaling down to community and neighborhood levels the space-time dynamics that show mobility and mixing of people. That data is powerful in allowing us to protect ourselves without shutting down economic activity. And this is commendable work, especially the section looking at identifying the most vulnerable among us. Ladies and gentlemen, the FST embraces the One UWI mission, and we join with you as Vice Chancellor, Sir Hilary Beckles, in reminding the public that UWI is one Caribbean university with one voice, serving people of the Caribbean and the world. We are therefore pleased to have Professor Clive Landis, Chair of the UWI COVID-19 Task Force in this forum. And now I invite him to speak on the regional response to COVID-19. Clive Landis, ladies and gentlemen, is an experienced medical researcher, and he's also a university administrator. He serves as pro-vice chancellor for undergraduate studies at the University of the West Indies, 
and he's also an outstanding researcher. He researches the immune system and viruses, including the established viruses like HIV, as well as emerging viruses like Zika and SARS-CoV-2. Please welcome Professor Clive Landis to make his presentation. Well, it's certainly my pleasure to be participating in this uh, forum of the uh, Faculty of Science and Technology, um, Science in Action, Fighting COVID-19. Um, I like the title. It seems like I've been doing this for the last few months. The title of my presentation is The Regional Response to COVID-19, and I will be taking this through the lens of the role of the UE Task Force, which um, uh, I am the chair of, and my substantive role in the university is as pro vice chancellor for the board for undergraduate studies. When the COVID-19 virus first started circulating around the world, it was very obvious to the university that uh, this was heading the way of a health um, crisis of international concern. And even before that was actually that status was declared by the WHO. The UE had already put together a group of experts and in fact we were in the middle of a presentation um, on UE TV called Demystifying the Coronavirus and a panelist on that um, uh, UE TV presentation was the head of the Caribbean Public Health Agency, Joyce St. John, and she was in Geneva and she heard while she was presenting that the WHO had declared it as a health emergency of international concern on January the 29th. On February the 28th, we officially announced the formation of the task force and this was before the pandemic was declared, which was on uh, March the 11th. Uh, Basically, the way that we have operated is that we always knew that to fight this pandemic, we had to have very clear messaging, we had to have very clear information and uh, a good data sharing so that we could reassure the Caribbean as to what was happening and why certain measures were being taken. So this is the uh, website of the task force um, and you can peruse that um, uh, at your leisure. This is the constitution of the task force. It was considerably larger than the Zika task force, which I also uh, chaired. And each task force has um, uh, a different composition because you're really dealing with, with different exigencies. So for Zika, you know, you would have had um, neurologists and pediatricians and things like that. But, but here we were much more concerned with um, uh, virologists, veterinary virologists, of note, uh, Christopher Ura is actually a coronavirus expert before any of us heard of coronaviruses. Um, and we also have uh, other virologists like Christine Carrington and uh, Josh Anzinger. Uh, we have critical care physicians, um, the uh, head of staff of the UE uh, hospital in Mona, Carl Bruce. We have Harold Watson, um, uh, we also have um, uh, a psychosocial unit um, uh, with members from each campus. Um, so Wendell Abel, Katija Khan, uh, Maria Maynard, and uh, Cecile Maynard. I actually like this slide because every time I look at it, it looks as if the whole of the task force is just sort of illuminated by the smile of Maria Maynard in the middle. Um, so in addition to Maria Maynard, on each side of her, we have a tourism expert and an economics expert. Um, we also have an ethicist and we have the leading pulmonologist, um, uh, Terence C. Mungle um, uh, from uh, St. Augustine. Also from St. Augustine, up at the top right, we have a gender expert. And finally, we have um, uh, a representative from the student body, Caleb Gardner, who is from the Five Islands campus. So we have all of the campuses um, represented. Um, and then we have from the center, we have um, uh, Dr. Rhonda Jaipal Ogaro, who is the head of marketing and communications, and Miss Janet Carew, who of course is, is head of um, uh, 
UETV. So um, together with the content experts, we then also had the means of disseminating uh, what we were doing. The task force's remit was really twofold. It was to coordinate the UE's internal readiness, which we called UE Ready, and it was to help inform the Caribbean's response. And uh, we have aggregated uh, the response to UE Science, UE Medicine, and UE Cares. So as far as the internal UE's readiness goes, um, we developed a COVID-19 management plan. We were very pleased to submit that to all of the campuses before the declaration of the pandemic and before the first case had been reported um, in a UE campus country. So, so we were able to keep ahead of this uh, epidemic. We also um, uh, made a projection of the epidemic so that we could inf um, allow the campuses to make an assessment of whether it was even feasible to conduct face-to-face -face exams um, uh, for the second semester. And of course, we concluded that no, it wouldn't be. And uh, that enabled the campuses to make the decision to move everything um, online. Uh, in terms of policy, wearing my other hat, I also um, had to uh, issue a lot of waivers. Um, I think it ended up being 1,500 waivers uh, for um, exam regulations because of the changes involved. And we also produced an evidentiary review. So we went across the evidence in the world on things like mask wearing, on things like you know uh, central air conditioning, um, whether they have a role in the spread, aerosol versus um, uh, airborne. So we, we weighed up all the evidence um, in order to help the uh, campuses to um, uh, enable the safe reopening of business and teaching um, uh, uh, on the campuses. And of course, we, we know that they are open for business and opening on the 30th of August for the new semester. In terms of the um, response to the region, we modeled the task force on the Zika task force, which was the first time that we had put together a task force like this for a pandemic. Previously, we had task forces which would go in, for example, after a weather event like Hurricane Dorian or something, you know, you would immediately send in the engineers, you know, the water um, technicians to make sure the water supply is okay, the buildings are um, sound. You would send in uh, uh, psychological counselors, development experts. But this was the first time for Zika that we had done the same thing for a pandemic. And so uh, we were able to really build on that model and we had all of the contacts and we were able to go back to CARICOM, back to CARFA and the regional governments and health agencies and say, look, we're here and uh, we're here to, to assist. So even though the Zika uh, approach was very collaborative. This was on a whole different level for, for COVID-19. So right from the first special emergency meeting on February the 4th, um, uh, hosted by the CARICOM Secretary General, uh, Ambassador Erwin LaRock, um, all the way through the heads of uh, government, um, uh, the ninth and 10th special emergency meetings, several meetings of uh, uh, COSOD. Um, I felt a bit like a diplomat uh, a lot of the time. And I was also assisted by other members of the task force who would sit in on these meetings. Uh, also the first emergency meeting of COSOD, um, uh, which was actually for education, where we had a very significant role to play there. Um, and then the Caribbean Tourism Organization and the CHTA, they had multi-stakeholder collaborations of which we were a part. And then the development partners uh, for the Eastern Caribbean, uh, they meet uh, bi-weekly and Sedema technical advisory meetings, they we meet, meet weekly and, and we make presentations to them. So we've been very deeply embedded in the whole uh, decision making and the, the uh, emergency response to the pandemic. And what's emerged really is UE as a regional observatory. This is a unique role that um, CARICOM asked of us and we are fulfilling it and, and we're able to uh, provide this kind of uh, granular data um, on a country to country basis. And uh, this is the output of the Georgia Lynn Chronic Disease Research Center. Um, and 
we do this daily. So we have algorithms that capture this information and we have these sophisticated outputs. Um, this, this is a heat map showing the daily cases and you can see that Haiti obviously has a very high caseload. They share a, a 400 kilometer border with the Dominican Republic, which has um, uh, an explosive outbreak. Uh, you would also see that Suriname, which shares a border with Brazil, um, has had some difficulty um, uh, with with cases. And and Jamaica, of course, right there um, uh, around about uh, April, it had its uh, fairly notorious um, call center outbreak, but it's managed to get on top of that. Um, you would also see that now having reopened, that some countries like Jamaica, the Bahamas, and also St. Vincent have had a little uptick um, in their cases and you know this is to be expected as we open our borders and this kind of information is going to be critical to allow us to uh, keep on top of this but the overall picture is really one of containment so this uh, is an output from the 22nd of July and you can see that the growth rates are basically flat for all of the Caribbean countries um, you would note that Haiti uh, has the highest uh, growth rate um, but you can see that they've they've got on top of it and they've flattened it off um, and you would see that Suriname you know is uh, struggling with their growth rates as well and you had that um, uh, flight I think from Antigua where 34 persons a repatriation flight were positive and there's a big uptick there um, and you would notice that the Bahamas um, who just recently had cases imported into Grand Bahamas they would be uh, that little uptick would be noticeable uh, since they reopened their borders but this is basically a picture of containment and if you wanted to be sure of this um, and people might say oh you know maybe you're not doing enough testing and things like that well then you you have uh, the, the deaths that you can look at and and you know look at that panel on the left I mean really this is remarkable if you look at the 20 CARICOM countries, in, um, which include the six UK overseas territories, we haven't even had 300 deaths for the whole epidemic, for the whole region of 16 million people. This is extraordinary. And, and really, I would never have believed that we would achieve this remarkable containment and, um, uh, uh, when we first started out. Uh, we've also published on this because, you know, the world is very interested in uh, what the Caribbean has been able to achieve. So we have uh, two publications right now um, already published in Lancet Global Health and Research and Globalization, which really are speaking of this, this remarkable achievement in the Caribbean to contain the ep epidemic across a region. And if you wanted to, you know, uh, pinch yourself and say, well, yeah, but, but is this really real? Let's, let's benchmark ourselves against countries like New Zealand and Iceland and Singapore, which have contained the epidemic. Well, here you go. You know, I mean, I haven't shown all the countries here, but I have included, for example, Haiti, which has the biggest problem. And you can see that they still have a picture of containment uh, somewhere, between Sing um, somewhere between New Zealand, Iceland and Singapore. And they're certainly not at the level of um, uh, the UK, and you will note that this is a log scale. So, so you know, um, across the region, we have achieved containment, and the information that UE has been able to put out has been absolutely critical on a country-to-country -country level to allow policymakers and decision makers to decide when to open, um, how to open, and uh, uh, to uh, guide um, all of their responses. And the pillars on which this containment has been achieved is really, um, it's almost old fashioned good science. So it's testing. The testing has been excellent. Um, so, uh, and, and I would say that for every epidemic, our testing has become better in the Caribbean. Now, the last time that European countries or the US experienced a global pandemic, would have been in 2009 for the so-called swine flu epidemic. But we've had the swine flu epidemic in 2009, we've had chikungunya 2013, we've had Zika 2016, and now COVID-19. In every epidemic, we've become better at testing. So whereas in uh, 2009, there really would only have been maybe one or two labs that could have done that testing, we now have 12 labs across the Caribbean that are doing this. And we also have excellent 
um, sample uh, uh, collection from the RSS, the Regional Security Service, even when Liet and all of the flights were grounded and cancelled, they were sending samples to the CAFA lab in Trinidad for those countries that didn't have their own lab. And if you have testing, you have to have a quick turnaround because in that period where people are waiting for their test, they could be contacting and transmitting the disease to other people. So our contact tracing is very good here. Um, our isolation procedures and quarantine, all of it is good. And we've managed to protect the hospital system and the intensive care system in the Caribbean. And these are extremely quiet. Uh, they, they have not been overwhelmed in any way. So, so we really have achieved containment. So in terms of UE medicine, um, uh, here are uh, the pictures of the, uh, the health centers, U UE's um, teaching hospitals in Jamaica, Bridgetown, uh, Nassau, and uh, Port of Spain. And in some ways, we take it for granted that the majority of consultants and um, nurses and uh, uh, paramedical professionals um, laboratory technicians would all have come out of the UE system. So UE's uh, uh, graduates are populating all these, all these buildings. But we didn't really want to dwell on that. We really wanted to focus the work of the task force actually on, on research. So here is a piece of research that failed spectacularly, and I am so happy it failed. The WHO Solidarity Clinical Trial. So UE is registered with the WHO to undertake um, the testing of existing drugs, uh, which are against um, uh, other diseases like malaria and uh, Ebola and HIV, and to see whether they're effective against COVID-19. And do you know why our research has failed? Because we don't have sufficient patients. We don't have the patients in the intensive care um, uh, sites in order to be able to participate meaningfully in this trial. So this is one piece of research why I'm so glad that uh, we failed. Um, and long may it last. Um, I, 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 I am confident that we are able to maintain uh, what we have achieved thus far with very, very low levels of um, severe cases and, and uh, deaths. And uh, we are also contributing, uh, as we did for the Zika epidemic, in what I would call um, uh, the sort of genetic detective work. And we are, of course, looking to see if there are any lineages, for example, um, the G614D um, lineage, which has been spoken about recently, whether we have that in our region. And then we feed this into global databases. And in terms of uh, uh, UE Cares, uh, it would start with the work of the uh, ethicist, um, Anna Perkins. And it's, 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 it's vital that um, uh, in a new paradigm where you have persons who are making rules and imposing policies, policies that affect the lives of whole nations and peoples, that um, uh, they're underpinned with, with ethical principles. And the principles uh, would be respect, inclusion, and responsibility. And if we really just focus on respect, I don't want to go through everything, um, we uh, respect the dignity of all persons recognizing the equal inherent value of each person, person. And that includes the right to life, which is oftentimes linked and dependent on a right of access to healthcare. And although we haven't really seen um, an overwhelming of our healthcare system, a lot of persons have either been unwilling or unable to go to the healthcare centers to treat existing conditions, which is, is a shame because we could be getting um, secondary uh, mortality from persons who have serious illnesses like HIV, cancer, etc., who are not accessing the healthcare system. So um, the ethicist uh, has put together a um, ethical um, a handbook, a short handbook, which um, I contributed to as well, and that is now uh, published and it's um, uh, on our website and there for policymakers and leaders uh, to look at. It's it's quite short because we didn't want to make it too long uh, so that people would be put off from reading it. The psychosocial unit was really very active and on uh, already by April the 9th, they had conducted the UE Rapid Response COVID-19 Impact Survey, 
But of course, um, we're not just interested in knowing what's happening amongst our staff and students, um, but that survey using validated instruments, and uh, which was also uh, had undergone ethical review, was also used um, uh, and rolled out, for example, in Trinidad, and we intend to um, uh, roll this out to other countries as well. And we're also participating in similar um, psychological impact surveys uh, in, 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 in multi-country studies. But just looking at the um, survey, which was completed on UE students and staff, and just giving you the, the, the highlights of that on this slide, as expected, the students and staff were suffering from a number of uh, psychological concerns during the pandemic period, uh, such as fear of failure, uh, the ability to pursue and achieve educational and professional goals, managing their finances, managing school and work responsibilities, problems with concentration and uh, the fear of falling ill. And when we looked at um, the level of anxiety and depressive symptoms, uh, and I've shown it here for students, where 67%, two thirds of our students had either severe or moderate anxiety symptoms. Now this pie chart normally has four quadrants, um, but we actually had no students who had minimal symptoms. They all had either mild, moderate or severe symptoms. Um, and then for staff, it would be 60% with severe and moderate symptoms. So, you know, this, these are very high levels which would, um, uh, which would merit having interventions, um, psychosocial interventions, and uh, that has uh, actually underpinned what we um, have had done. So part of the policy response for students who have been caught up in this um, pandemic through no fault of their own and had to move all their teaching online, they had to move their assessments online, is that if they fail uh, a subject, we will have this grade called fail minus penalty. So there will be no academic penalty if they fail, they would simply need to retake the test again, and then that grade would then apply. Um, and so that takes away the specter of academic warnings or um, asking students to have a required to withdraw uh, from the semester that was so badly affected by COVID-19. And I'm also quite pleased that uh, we were able to, with the, um, the Caribbean Examination Council at the special emergency meeting of COSOD, that we were able to have unanimous endorsement by all regional ministries of education of the waiver of the matriculation uh, requirement, uh, one part of it, um, which uh, this is the matriculation requirement of what CAPE students normally have to do to get into UE. Now we realize that with exams being postponed, um, uh, thankfully they have been completed now, but even that wasn't certain at the time, um, uh, that the, the results will not be in in order to allow people to apply and start the semester by August the 30th. So for this semester, um, we have said that students who have passed at least two CAPE subjects at unit one or two at grades one to four, who also have the re requisite CSEC subjects and are currently registered for unit one and two qualify. And what we've taken out is and have successfully completed. So we're allowing them to matriculate into UE based on their first um, year of CAPE, because the second year of CAPE won't have been graded by the time that uh, the, the semester will start. So this was a policy response based on all the anxiety that we were picking up, not only in our student body, but also in those students who were stuck in this PERDA, um, uh, couldn't do their CAPE exams and didn't know where they were going. And of course, to reassure um, anyone, uh, members of the public, that this doesn't um, uh, affect the integrity of uh, UE standards because matriculation is really a minimum admission standard and other faculties, for example, law and medicine, would be able to um, establish their own faculty-specific re uh, admission regulations that go beyond that um, minimum admission standard. So this isn't going to lead to a sudden sort of surge in applicants um, uh, to law or, or medicine. And moving on to um, uh, the role of the gender specialist, um, 
So it's very important to uh, have a gender lens um, when you're uh, responding to a pandemic um, uh, because you would find that the uh, particularly females would be most affected by the pandemic because they're most more likely to lose their job, more likely to have to take on um, a domestic um, uh, housework and, and caring work, and they're less likely to be able to rejoin the workforce because of that. And they would also uh, be subject to gender-based violence. Um, um, and then, of course, there's the whole recovery from um, uh, and, and coming out of lockdown, which, again, you know, if you don't have gender representation on those committees, you would end up with what happened in the UK, which was a bit of a some, something between a travesty and a joke, where a committee that was all dominated by, by men, uh, the first three activities that they permitted after lockdown was... Um, uh, angling, uh, shooting, and um, what was the third one? Um, I can't remember now. Another very male-orientated um, activity. Um, so uh, it's very important to have that representation, and we have um, the uh, experts from the IGDS um, uh, who are on the task force. Um, and in terms of the uh, economic impact, when you have an unprecedented event like this, you know, the only sort of playbook we have is from 1918, from the Spanish flu. Um, uh, simulation exercises can be a useful methodology to sort of investigate these complex scenarios. And so we conducted a simulation exercise um, uh, with our expert from the Sir Arthur Lewis um, Institute for Social and Economic Studies, um, which looked at two hypothetical Caribbean countries, one being a tourism dependent country and one a resource exporting country, which are coming out of a four month lockdown. And uh, this underpinned two um, uh, uh, webinars um, which were organized by Silices, and you can see them, them here. And uh, finally, in terms of uh, tourism recovery, our expert um, uh, Michelle McLeod, who's a real dynamo from the uh, Center for Hotel and Tourism Management in the Bahamas. She worked very closely with the CTO and the Caribbean Hotel Association to uh, look at, uh, assess the situation, which of course is absolutely dire. You would see uh, in the middle of that diagram the downtick from the largest uh, recession since the 1930s um, in 2008. But look what's happened uh, for COVID. <laughs> it's just on another scale altogether. And uh, so she has put together a lot of resources, which are again available through our website. Um, and she's uh, written a tourism recovery report because when we come out of this, which we will, tourism is a fundamentally resilient sector. As soon as it's safe to travel, people will travel. Um, we want to reopen better. And so, uh, so a, a key point of the tourism recovery report is um, uh, to go back to the San Juan Accord for the Open Skies Policy. And, and, and this would allow the Caribbean, you know, to get away from the traditional source markets. And you can see the problem with the over-reliance on one source market, like the Bahamas with the US. They desperately wanted to open to the US. And when they did so, they were importing a lot of cases and had to um, uh, curtail uh, that reopening. So we want to diversify um, uh, with the Open Skies Policy so that we can you know, enter negotiations with, with, with them, uh, new markets and, for example, Singapore Airlines and Qantas and try and uh, reopen better than we did before. Um, and and uh, finally, the students um, uh, using the information uh, from the uh, psychological impact study on students, they uh, have held a number of these um, uh, uh, coping webinars where they speak about uh, and have experts uh, on picks like study skills and time management, how to, um, uh, what to do with your children when you're trying to study and uh, relaxation techniques and that kind of thing. And importantly, not just aimed at UE students, but these could be attended by anyone, you know, of, of, in any of the tertiary level institutions in the Caribbean or indeed for anybody, um, uh, so that they uh, serve a, a social good. And uh, the webinars and seminars and conferences that UETV has, has held are just legion. And really, um, UETV and the marketing department have been tremendous in 
uh, being able to bring the work of the UE during this pandemic uh, to the public um, and, and, and to our policymakers. Um, there at the top left, we also ca carry live with an agreement uh, with the World Health Organization, um, their briefings on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays um, through our terrestrial TV. And uh, here again, just um, um, more of these uh, webinars. Uh, some of these would be campus-based. You would maybe remember that one, COVID-19 approaching code, code red. That was um, uh, in uh, one, one from Mona. It had uh, record numbers of um, uh, attendees. And I think it was because of the, um, the title. It was just so appealing or maybe so scary. So that concludes um, my uh, presentation. And uh, right from the beginning, and I have to stress that I came up with this before, um, uh, the Director General of the WHO did. Um, uh, our motto really is, together we will get through this. And, and so uh, in our society, you know, with the information that people have, with collective actions, with collective responsibility, everyone working together, we've done a fantastic job up to now and I'm very confident that we can continue to do so until we see through this epidemic um, uh, to the end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Landis. You know, I've always believed that a coordinated approach towards the sharing of knowledge and expertise coupled with joint action, because expertise and knowledge, res research results must be coupled with action. But joint action as one Caribbean university, as one Caribbean, this is what we need to strengthen the resilience of small island states of the Caribbean and to protect both our individual and common interests. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is someone I take great pleasure in working with. She and I share common interests. She's a chemist an educator, and a science outreach enthusiast. When you meet her, you will know. She is Dr. Inka Brown, graduate of the University of the West Indies, Mona, with a doctorate in organic chemistry and lecturer in the Department of Chemistry here in the Faculty of Science and Technology. She is one of our rising stars. Dr. Brown's area of research emphasizes the development of easier, cheaper, and more environmentally friendly ways to put together various chemical building blocks to make heterocyclic compounds with medicinal and industrial applications. She's also very interested in science communication and increasing public engagement and access. And in the last 10 years, she has been actively involved in organizing academic conferences, science festivals, science competitions, and other activities to bring science to a wider audience. It is always a pleasure to work with Dr. Brown, and I invite you to listen to her speak on the topic tackling COVID-19 misconceptions. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Singh Wilmot, and thank you to the Faculty of Science and Technology for giving me this opportunity to join this broader discussion about COVID-19 and our capacity to respond and to recover. So globally, the past few months has been focused on controlling the spread of the virus. Right, so like many other highly transmissible diseases, we know that we can start out with a handful of persons, and then that quickly increases. And then if measures are not put in place, then we can have it ballooning, and then a significant chunk of persons are going to be affected with COVID-19 in a relatively short space of time. And so while we know that most persons are mildly affected by COVID-19, we do recognize that some persons have significant challenges and that can require hospitalization. And this hospitalization happening in this short space of time can quickly overwhelm our healthcare systems. And not only healthcare systems will be impacted, can overwhelm our healthcare systems. And not only will this impact the treatment and care of affected persons, but that's also going to 
make it difficult for other healthcare users to access facilities. And so we don't know a lot about this novel virus, but what we do know is that we can minimize contact with body fluids, minimize droplet inhalation, and if we're mindful of being in enclosed areas or touching contaminated surfaces, then we should be able to reduce the spread of this novel coronavirus. And so those things have led to a three-pronged approach of social distancing, of wearing masks, and treating surfaces that are high touch. And so bringing those together has led to a flattening of the curve, and we've been able to, for the most part, control the spread of the disease here in Jamaica by adhering to these strategies. And in so doing, what we've done is limited the number of seriously affected persons at any one time, and so we're better able to cope and manage this scenario. But now we're in a transition stage. Right, Persons are moving from working exclusively at home, they're returning to physical locations. We're navigating the process of opening our borders. Who should we let in? How do we go about doing that? And then, of course, there's that ongoing discussion about the new academic term. How are we going to manage schooling? And so we're in very uncertain times. We're in very dynamic times. We're in very challenging times. But in order to ensure that we do not lose the gains that we've made, we have to be very clear on how we're going forward and we need to be very sure about the best practices. And if we don't have that clarity and if we don't have that surety, then we can go back to square one. And so that's why I really want to focus on some misconceptions that are floating around. So I've been asked to tackle some of the COVID-19 misconceptions. Misconceptions, if left unchecked, that it can lead to us going back to a situation that we've just tried to claw ourselves out of. And in particular, the misconceptions I want to focus on are treating surfaces. So how do we go about removing coronavirus from our surfaces? We know that the major mode of transmission is interpersonal. So being con coming in contact with body fluids, coming in contact with droplets when persons are speaking, coughing, sneezing. But surfaces can be a mode of transmission and that's something that we need to be very mindful of. So if we are not sure about how best to treat our surfaces, then this can make us less effective at keeping ourselves safe. And so what I want to talk about is cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting. We hear those terms thrown around all the time. Are they all the same? What exactly do they mean? How do we carry out those activities? And then there's choosing and applying products. Uh, we tend to reach for products that are branded, that are very front and center, but are other products equally effective and useful? And then there are persons who want to look at chemical-free alternatives, so we'll talk a little bit about that. So sanitizing versus cleaning versus disinfecting. Our major aim is to sanitize, and sanitizing involves reducing germs on surfaces to a safe level. What cleaning refers to is the physically removing the dirt, the impurities, the germs. And during cleaning, you don't always kill the germs, but they are removed from the surface. Disinfecting, however, is what is going to kill the germs, and that usually requires the use of a chemical. And so in sanitizing, our two main objectives, we want to break down the protective coat of the coronavirus, and we also want to be able to disable and destroy any of the genetic material, and so the virus is no longer infective. The best approach in sanitizing is that you need to clean before you disinfect. All right, so many of us would just use our disinfecting agent, and we would spray the surface, and we do a quick wipe, and we think that we've done the job. But by not cleaning beforehand, what that does is reduce the power of our chemical to disinfect. So you need to clean the surface thoroughly, get as rid of as much dirt, germs, grimes as possible, and then you use your disinfecting agent. And that is helping us to achieve sanitization. 
What products do we need to use for or sanitizing? Recommended products from the World Health Organization and the CDC and other governing bodies that we use soap or detergent. Ethanol, also known as alcohol, is good to use, but it must be over 60%. We can use isopropyl alcohol, which is commonly known as rubbing alcohol. That must be over 70%. And then there are the quaternary ammonium compounds, and these are found in a variety of products, both locally and internationally manufactured ones. So we don't have to focus on a specific brand, but we need to look at the ingredients. So looking at the packaging of our cleaning wipes or sprays, once it has quaternary ammonium compounds, then we um, can use them for sanitizing. How do these things work? Because understanding how they killed the virus can give us a better sense of the best ways to use them. So we're going to use our quaternary ammonium compounds as an example. So we see that for the coronavirus, that outside coat that protects the virus, it is made up of these two layers. And the layers have um, chains that are stacked tightly together, and those protect the virus genetic material. Quaternary ammonium compounds, once they're sprayed onto the virus, what they do is they disrupt this layer. And so once this layer is disrupted, it means that the protective coating loses its integrity, the genetic material spills out, that is also attacked in a similar manner by the quaternary ammonium compound, and then the virus is destroyed, the surface is sanitized. Similar action happens whether we're using our alcohol or our rubbing alcohol or our soap. They also disrupt this layer and that helps to kill the virus. Other recommended products are hydrogen peroxide within the three to 6% strength that's commonly found in pharmacies or other stores and sodium hypochlorite, which is known as the bleach. And we wouldn't be using the bleach directly. What we would do is make a solution of the bleach. We could use four teaspoons in a quart or a liter of water, um, but the solution must be made fresh every 24 hours. The bleach is so reactive that after 24 hours, it is going to break down and it's not going to be as effective. How do bleach and hydrogen peroxide work to kill the coronavirus? It's a slightly different way from how our quaternary ammonium compounds and soaps react. What the bleach does, it transforms the structure of the coating of the virus. And in transforming the structure, the coating can no longer hold together. And so you're going to have the virus splitting apart. The genetic material is going to be exposed, which also gets attacked and changed by the bleach or the hydrogen peroxide, and that results in the death of the virus. We've heard suggestions about using vinegar, or that if you have some alcoholic beverages, like your wine or your beer on hand, that those could be useful. Uh, not recommended. Those are generally too dilute to do anything. Um, unless your alcoholic beverage is over 130 proof, it's not doing anything. And so you would pour it on your surface and the virus is going to remain intact and it's still there and it can be effective. So we would focus on the recommended um, cleaning agents. Apart from choosing the correct product, you need to have the proper application and you need to thoroughly wet the surface and wait one to two minutes and that would be enough time for these chemicals to interact with the protective coating and to break it apart and to kill the virus. Most importantly, we need to avoid mix-up. We like to mix our cleaning compounds in the thought that that would make them more effective, you know, supercharge them. But in fact, what we're doing is reducing the effectiveness of the compound and we're also producing hazardous byproducts. So some examples, if you mix bleach with vinegar or bleach with toilet bowl cleaner, what you're going to generate is chlorine gas. All right, that is toxic to you and that's not going to be as effective as the bleach in doing what you want it to do. Also mixing bleach with cleaners like ammonia will generate compounds known as chloramines, which are irritant and highly toxic. So what you want to do is use the disinfecting agent as recommended on the packaging. All right, persons are fearful of chemicals. We have this chemophobia where we think that anything that has the name chemical is bad. We know that's not true. But for persons opting to use different methods of cleaning, 
We have those that don't involve chemicals, such as steamers. They can be a useful addition. What we have is supercharged water molecules. So they're steam, they're high energy water, and they're going to break apart our coronavirus. And that would be more useful for soft material that is harder to treat with your quaternary ammonium compounds or your bleach or your soap. Also fairly popular is UV light. We see that some companies have been selling handheld ultraviolet light. Um, the problem with that, it has to be a specific type of UV light. So you have to be very careful that you are getting UVC um, UV light with these products and they can be very damaging to eyes and skin if they're not used properly. So these would be better in the hands of professionals who know how to take the necessary safety precautions. And this high energy UV light will also break apart the coronavirus coating. Uh, one area of active research is copper containing surfaces. So we do know that copper ions have the capacity to destroy germs such as bacteria and viruses and they are effective against coronavirus. However, this takes several hours. So persons who are busy selling things like no-touch door openers that are made of copper so you can use it to hold surfaces instead of your hand, you have to be mindful that the coronavirus, if present, is going to be on the copper for several hours. And so that is also going to need to be sanitized. So while it can be a useful tool, it is not a fail-safe and it's not a replacement for our disinfecting agents. Also, we see where persons are replacing fixtures with brass or bronze, so door handles and taps, other high-touch surfaces with those made out of brass or bronze because of their copper content. And those can be useful in areas such as hospitals and schools per, that have a lot of traffic going through, but they also are going to require sanitization to be completely effective. All right, so just to recap, the three C's of coronavirus sanitizing, we have to choose our products wisely, we have to apply them correctly, and most importantly, they need to be consistently used. So there's going to be a high frequency of sanitizing as persons interact with these surfaces. So it's important that we tackle any misconceptions because that helps us to better manage the pandemic and to move forward. And here are some links for information that you can here are some links for sources that you can go to if you need information to answer your queries as we continue to try and keep the curve flat. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for a simple and informative presentation, which I am sure resonated with all our viewers as it resonated with me. You know, when I say, Dr. Brown, I feel it in my bones. COVID-19 presents a clear health and economic challenge to all of us. But disinformation will impede any response to this crisis and ultimately put pe people's lives at risk. We live in a chemical world. And as a chemist, I know it myself. And we must use these chemicals with respect. We must show them respect if we are to derive the benefits from them and at the same time minimize the risks associated with their use. Thank you once again. Now, our final contributor this afternoon was strategically reserved for this point in the forum because her energy and youth coupled with her substance will wake up any audience, even one that has sat through five other presentations. Ms. Danielle Mullings, ladies and gentlemen, is the Guild representative in the Faculty of Science and Technology. Danielle is a multidimensional software engineering student who is said to be one of the field's brightest young minds and who believes strongly in the power of tech and innovation in edifying society. Daniel aspires to become a world leader in technology and is also passionate about documentary making, which she sees as the gateway to cultural retention and preservation of regional identity. Her natural affinity for leadership and youth empowerment 
has brought her in service on youth councils, both locally and internationally, representing the voice of young people in technology, education, national issues, and tech for health. I now invite Ms. Danielle Mullings to make her contribution on the student response to COVID-19. All right, thank you, Dr. Singh Wilmot, for that introduction. Uh, my name is Daniel Mullings, and I am the president of the FST Guild Committee, otherwise known as the, F the Faculty of Science and Technology's um, representative on the Guild. So as we navigate through a time of immense change worldwide, our students are dedicated to enhancing the COVID-19 response. So on behalf of the Guild Committee and the students overall, it is my distinct pleasure to speak a bit about what our response to COVID-19 has been like. It's a faculty of greatness, it's been a great year, and it's going to be a great year. So to start off, we have been discussing for the rest of this series a, a variety of, of responses to COVID-19, right? We looked at the capacity of the faculty to respond, demystifying COVID-19 screening. We've looked at misconceptions. We've looked at the regional response. And now we want to bring it home to what are the students doing? Because the students are of paramount importance to the functioning of any faculty, the functioning of any educational institution. So what are they doing with what they've learned um, from, their from their professors, from their teachers, from their classmates? What is coming from the students? And to start off, I want to say, what is an FST student like? What are some adjectives we can use? And so we call, we call SciTech, or we call FST SciTech, so I'll be using that term interchangeably. So I'll say SciTech is comprised of innovative, technical, creative, passionate young leaders who are eager to edify their communities. And they're thus able to contribute in a myriad of ways. I would also say that we're united by that passion for STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, the arts, and of course, mathematics. So coming together, you have students with that kind of uh, technical background, that kind of passion, now coming together, and they've been thrust into a global pandemic with a lot of uncertainty, a lot of rapid change. And so the question becomes, if they have that much potential, then what is the role of the student? What is the role of young people in building back our communities and building back our country regionally, um, nationally, regionally, and internationally, of course? So I've come up with three main points that I would put it under, and this is from speaking with students, and we also did a survey to ask, like, what, what have you been doing? And so we identified three main ways. One is innovation. The second is digital education, kind of like digital literacy. And the third is advocacy. So we're going to go right into um, the first one. So I've put a, a quote up on screen, which is basically saying that um, change, the change inspires innovation, if you will. And so our students have been thrust into a, a world that is rapidly changing because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And so innovation is a must coming out of it. So let's see, what have our students been up to? Coming out of the departments of physics and computing, our students developed a healthcare gadget. And this is essentially a patient's vital monitoring system. Given that COVID the COVID-19 pandemic may cause hospitals to be overflowed or have too many, too many persons as opposed to that which it can accommodate, we're having now a gadget that can actually monitor patients from a distance and then feed their vitals information into whichever database, hospital, or information center that it would be needed for. So what you're seeing is our students have the capacity to innovate in the midst of a pandemic. So moving from here, what we're seeing is that our students have the capacity to identify issues, problem solve, and then execute on it. So our second point is digital education, which is basically digital literacy. And when we speak to this, it's interesting because it's somewhat of a role reversal. Because the concept of a student is that you're here to learn, you know, you, you, you're taking in information. But what we're seeing is that COVID-19 has been a grand catalyst for technological advancement across the Caribbean. Like, this is the first time you'd have wide scale online learning, you know, work from home. All of these are no common concepts that weren't common four or five months ago. And you look at it and says our students are uniquely positioned as digital natives, you know, someone who um, has a lot of exposure to technology already. Maybe not every single person, right? But a lot of our students already have exposure to technology, whether it is for what you've been working on for your classes. And it now puts them in a position where they can teach. 
they can thus educate a lecturer, let's say, on how to use Zoom or how to use a Blackboard Collaborate system. And so the capacity of our students to be digital educators is a, a whole realm to be explored. So there are many different aspects of digital literacy. There is, you know, how to use a computer, setting up an, an email, um, you know, many things that we may take for granted because we do it every day, but there's a, a large percentage of persons in our country, in the Caribbean, you know, in the world overall that have never been exposed to some of these technologies before. You know, it's always that face-to-face -face interaction. And so our students can help here. So I've brought up on screen, this is Nathan Downer. He is the past president or outgoing president of the UE Computing Society. And I worked with him to basically create some videos. And these are like tutorial videos for how to use Blackboard Collaborate because that's what the university was moving towards. And then these were, uh, as well as how to use Zoom. And then these videos were now circulated across the campus. I even saw some students from St. Augustine message me and say that they were watching to see how to use Blackboard Collaborate. Um, but essentially, again, this capacity that our students have to be able to teach and to be able to share um, some of that digital knowledge as we move into the technological age. So here we have a snippet of the video from Nathan Downer, and he's explaining how to use uh, Zoom properly, you know, some of the features that are available to you and how this can enhance, how this knowledge can enhance your use of the online space. Hi, my name is Nathan Downer, president of the UE Mono Computing Society. And today, we're going to be looking at how to use Zoom as a student. Now, one of the first things you want to do before joining a meeting is making sure your mic is muted so you don't disturb anyone. We can do this by clicking on the settings cog, going to audio, and then selecting mute microphone when joining a meeting. And of course, the same can be done on your smartphone. The next thing we're going to look at is how to join a Zoom meeting. The first way is with a meeting ID. This meeting ID will be provided for you in the course container on RVLE for the respective course. So. Ensure that the name you use is the same one you use to register with the school so that you can be identified. When you click on the link, it's going to take you to the browser where it will ask you to allow it to open in your app. Now remember, have your mic muted when you're entering the meeting. Okay. So now on to changing the views. Zoom has two main views, the speaker view, which is the default one, and the gallery view. Speaker view allows us to focus on the person who is doing something at the moment, for example, the one speaking or sharing their screen. And gallery view will allow you to see as many participants as your device specs allow. Now along with the two views mentioned a while ago, the mobile app has an extra mode called safe driving mode. When it comes to communication in Zoom, you're not limited to just audio and video. But if you'd like, you can also use a chat to reach out to everyone in the meeting or individuals like your lecturer, who would likely be the host of the meeting. Now, if you'd like to audibly ask a question, the protocol is that you raise your hand and wait till you're identified to then unmute your mic and speak. You can raise your hand by going to participants and then clicking on raise hand. The same can be done in the app by hitting the more button at the bottom right and then clicking raise hand. You can also use the chat from the app as well, clicking more and then on chat. Now if for some reason you'd like to share your screen with the class, whether it is to show an assignment or a particular problem you're having, you can do this with the button at the bottom. Here you can select from any one of your open windows or your entire desktop. Let's open Microsoft Word. Oh, 
You can stop sharing, you can pause sharing, or you can also annotate and draw on the screen. This helps to provide a very rich collaboration experience as your teacher can also annotate and make corrections and suggestions. How are you Zoom? Thanks for watching. Stay safe. I did a video now for the Blackboard Collaborate as well as general online learning tips. So students were able to look at this video now and say, okay, this is how I access my class. This is how I, I raise my hand virtually. This is how I raise a, a concern in the online virtual classroom space. And so again, it's a, I guess this will be an intersection of technology and then media and communications and being able to um, also create videos and um, to assist in that learning process. So here we have a snippet of that video. Hi Pelicans, my name is Daniel Mullins. Are you a student just like you? I will be helping us all learn how to use the Blackboard Collaborate platform. Let's go. To access a Blackboard Collaborate course room, you first have to log on to OrVLE. So navigate to the OrVLE webpage and log in. Now that we've signed in, you must navigate to the course that you'd like to access the Blackboard Collaborate course room for. For me, that's phone 1014, crit. Now that you're on the course page, you need to find the link to the Blackboard Collaborate course room. This normally has an icon that looks like a green puzzle piece or it's the Blackboard Collaborate logo. This will now load a list of sessions. The main course room will be the first session. You look here to see if it's unlocked, which means you can enter the room, or if it's locked, which means you cannot enter the room. For most courses, your lecturer should let you know what frame of time before a class starts that you can enter. One important aspect to note is that a course room is separate from a course activity room. Your course room is more likely where your main lectures will take place. However, for your smaller tutorial classes, they will be in a course activity room such as these below. For many lecturers, your, your main course room will always be available. This may not be in some instances, however, for most. For your specific tutorial classes, however, you must access it at the specific time listed below the class. However, once it is unlocked, you can enter. So click and then select Join Course Room. It will then load the Blackboard Collaborate interface where your class will now take place. We'll go through the various sections of this interface in another video. From this page, you are also able to access class recordings. If you wish to do so, select the hamburger menu icon in the top left hand corner. Now select the recordings tab. As you can see, there are currently no recordings available. However, once a lecturer has finished a class and makes the recording available, it will show up on this page. If you'd like to go back to access your classes, simply select the hamburger menu and then sessions. Now you have a list of all your course sessions again. That's all for this lesson. My name is Daniel Mullins and thanks for watching. Have a great class. All right. So. I also want to speak to uh, the teacher success program. I worked with um, a company that the Ministry of Education partnered with in trying to continue online, to continue learning in an online manner, given the COVID-19 pandemic. And what I found interesting about it though, was that our team had uh, four persons and three of us were university students. So I'm from UWE, and someone from NCU and someone, um, again, so three students put together and led by a manager. And we were able to execute a two month long teacher success program for teachers in Jamaica, as well as teachers in the Bahamas. 
And so it would have comprised of weekly webinars. We did everything from the 21st century skills for a digital educator, um, how can teachers learn to advance themselves during this period. Um, we also did one-on-one -on -one sessions. So a teacher may say, you know, Daniel, I want to learn more about how to use PowerPoint, how do I put a presentation together? So we did a series of seminars, like hundreds of teachers, especially in Bahamas, this, the class size was very large. But again, just alluding to that capacity of our students to teach what they know and to impart knowledge during this time as everybody is moving towards a technological age. And moving from there, I'll also mention the Zoom refresher sessions that we did. And essentially, there is a one month break between the um, one month break allowing for the university to prep teachers for online delivery. And so when school started back, students were like, whoa, I've been out of class for a month now. I really don't remember what was going on. And so I was able to organize with some of the, the postgraduate students to say, could you help us out here and there? We set up an online session and students are able to come on, revise what they did the month before and kind of get ready and back in the zone for online learning. So there are, there's a range of ways that we can really contribute during this pandemic. And I want to say that this is by no means like an extensive list of what our students are doing because there are students running scholarship pages online, um, virtual CSEC and CAPE study sessions, you know, they may look at mental health awareness. They're looking at so many different issues in their own way, and a lot of it is aided by the technology. And I specifically as well would like to say there's one student who has over like 20,000 followers on his um, CXC or CAPE study guide page, and he is aiding thousands of students across the Caribbean, literally. Like the, the, his website crashes <laughs> every now and then because of how many students are trying to access it to get some of his tutorial videos or he's helping out um, as well as just posting content that could help students during this time. So there's a range of applications and ways that our students are responding to COVID-19. Some of it may have been started from before, but a lot of it was also um, created during the crisis, during the midst of, of challenge. And so the last point I'd like to speak on is advocacy. And I would like to say that advocacy doesn't always take the traditional form, you know, getting up on stage and, and speaking in that, you know, the normal way that you would see an advocate. And there are many movements that would have come out over the COVID-19 period. I think they're, I like to call them COVID-19 induced because um, I think COVID showed a lot of the disparity and a lot of the divide in the world in various areas and students were taking to, maybe it was social media, maybe they were making their own videos, whatever it was, they were taking to lend their voice to these issues. And so I believe that from the advocacy perspective, our students are able to contribute to, or lend their voices to ad advocating for equitable healthcare, whether around the world or locally advocating to hold our leaders and our peers accountable for the change that we'd like to see in society because COVID showed so much disparity. And the third point would be to advocate for the digital divide because this is a grand reality and many students in the midst of the pandemic as well were faced with not being able to continue their studies because they didn't have access or reliable access to internet or they didn't have a device or whatever it was. And I saw many students coming out to say, this is a real issue, not just for students, not just at you know, this level, but across the entire scale. If we're moving into a more technologically advanced society, we need to have the digital divide be lessened out a bit. So there are many issues that our students can advocate to. Their voices are important. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't take that traditional form. Maybe it is social media. That's fine. But we're speaking to the capacity of our students to speak up and be, be informed about issues and lend their voices to universal change. And I speak to that in this quote here. Um, this is from World Youth Skills Day. And I basically said the exact same point that social media allows us to connect on a, a wide scale. A lot of us allow us to put our voices together as a collective and say, this is what young people believe. And here is our opinion, our perspective, and please take it into account. So moving on from there, um, again, these three points, innovation, digital literacy, and advocacy are just three ways that students can help, three ways that we've identified. But there are many other ways that I'm sure can be explored. 
However, whichever way it is, our students are the future, and our students are helping in building back our country, or you know, our nation, our region, and the world overall. One small change makes a ripple effect out. So I want to end with a message, basically, for any student or any young person that may be watching. Um, and it comes from one of my favorite quotes, which is, if your actions create a legacy that inspires others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, then you're an excellent leader. So I'm encouraging you to get involved, you know, meet new people, believe in your potential to be great, trust in your astronomical aspirations, and set foot on this journey with a centered and focused approach. We believe in you. Some of our students are already doing it, and you can most definitely do it too. So identify what are the issues in your, maybe it's your community, maybe it's in your household, or maybe it's in your your school, whichever environment you're in, maybe it's your church group, whichever field or, or spe specific set of persons that you're reaching out to, if you can come up with some sort of solution, even if no matter how small it is, try your best to execute and maybe find like-minded persons to put together and create that change. But you're most definitely capable of doing it. So that's the, basically the end of the presentation and I'd like to end just with um, get connected with us, the FSTGC, or the Faculty of Science and Technologies Guild Committee. We're literally on like every social media platform you can think of. Um, there's YouTube, all the links are on screen and we'll also have somebody post them in the comments right now so you can click and directly go there. But we're on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, the whole works and we have an amazing PR team that will reach out to you immediately if you'd like to get connected and stay in touch. So that being said, Thank you for listening. Again, my name is Daniel Mullings and enjoy your day. What an absolute pleasure it is to listen to this young lady. Now, Daniel's power, her passion, her pride in her craft and those whom she represents was obvious in her presentation. And I would love her to be able to talk some more with some of you young people out there in the audience so some of that can continue to rub off on all of you. That presentation highlighting science in action, yielding innovation for more young people to fight COVID-19. You know, as I listened, I felt a regenerated spirit of hope as I saw the future of science and indeed Jamaica's future in good hands. But you know, Daniel, it would be nice if we could take the information coming out of Paris's work at MGI and create an app that we, that we could all have on our phones. You know, as we move around the island, when I come to Ligani, I can check my app to know, you know, how many cases are in Ligani, and that would guide my actions in Ligani and possibly help us in some sort of control against COVID-19 as we move about our activities. I know it is in the rest of the world, and I feel it's coming from you and your team here um, in the student body at, at FST. So all that is left for me to do now is to thank all of you who have helped to make this event possible. First, the speakers, Dr. Andre Coy, who established that the Faculty of Science and Technology here at UIMONA is advancing the mission of science to make people's lives better with interventions putting science in action and fighting COVID-19. Dr. Sandra Jackson, who demystified COVID-19 screening, building understanding of a process which is critical to preventing transmission and fighting this virus. Dr. Paris Liu Ai Jr., Managing Director of Mona Geoinformatics Institute, for all that you've done to help Jamaica track and predict COVID-19 and for taking the time to explain it to us today. You and your team have established that every hour, every minute, every second, science is in action in Jamaica, fighting COVID-19 in real time and giving us data which can help us to protect the most vulnerable among us, inform policy decisions and guide our daily actions. Prof. Clive Landis, director of the UE Task Force on COVID-19, has shown the very important initiative at work 
to harness the expertise and resources of the UAE and direct a Caribbean response to COVID-19. We are stronger when we work together. Dr. Inka Brown, who broke the science right, right down and tackled some of the misconceptions that are out there, arming us with credible information, arming us with the science to fight COVID-19. Finally, our shining star, FST Guild representative, Ms. Danielle Mullings, who showed science being put into action by UE FST students. Thank you all for your tremendous contribution to this forum. I want to also thank the hardworking team that worked to bring you this event. The entire external engagement committee in the Faculty of Science and Technology, led by Dr. Andre Coy. I want to especially thank Ms. Terian Collins Frey and Mr. Maxwell Williams for their exceptionally hard work. The team at UETV for making this production possible. And thanks to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. I am Marvadine Singh Wilmot, your moderator. Remember to join me here on August 5th for round two in fighting COVID-19, science in action. All the best to you and remember, keep safe.